Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Let's take one minute and just take a couple of deep breaths and land in this beautiful space. Thank you, Creator, for allowing us to be here, for joining together for this most important conversations in this very, very crucial time in history, especially right here in Colorado. Colorado is the land of the Apache, the Nahua, the Ute, the Cheyenne, the Arapaho, the Comanche, the Kiowa, and about 48 other tribes who have past, present, and hopefully future in these lands. I'm sure you all have heard land acknowledgements before, and it is time that we go beyond the land acknowledgement. And what that is, is just to take a minute to realize that we are in borrowed lands, we are in stolen lands. Oh, sorry, you can use the microphone. Oh, right. I don't have to scream. Can you hear me? Okay, great, thank you, thank you. Um, the reason it is very important for us to realize this, especially in these conversations, is we're talking about plant medicine. And a lot of our plant medicines have been taken into the bigger picture called psychedelics. And the first thing I will say is that we need to separate psychedelics from sacred plant medicine. They're very different, they have different lineages, they come from different places, and they are actually for different people. So I'll start with a very controversial topic right there. Welcome. Um, I'm Ana Medina. I am from Mexico, and uh, I come, I am a mestiza woman, which means I am mixed. I, I come, part of my family comes from Spain and Portugal, and the rest of my lineage comes from the very south of Mexico from the Mayans, and from the very north of Mexico, the Yaqui, the Mayo, um, and other tribes of the north of Mexico. And uh, I am going through a process of decolonizing myself and re-indigenizing. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about what that process looks like. So I decided today when, when I came up with this topic, um, world-class ethical dilemma, um, I've had a lot of, I've been doing a lot of thinking about how I want to approach this topic and then I realized the best way to do it is for me to tell you my personal story. My personal story through growing up in Mexico City, which is the concrete capital of the world, um, surrounded by incredible culture and uh, incredible indigenous wisdom, yet so separate uh, from it at the same time because I come from a very classist um, society. So I will get into all of that in a minute, but first I want to let you know that I have a beautiful firekeeper, my friend Liz, who is holding the fire for us. It's a very important element to bring into the conversation, especially when we talk about things that are uncomfortable, um, that we must face. It's very, very important that we have these conversations um, at this time with the, what's happening, especially in Colorado, and the world is watching. The world is watching what we're doing. And uh, so, I do ask that you take care of yourselves through these conversations if it gets uncomfortable. Put what I say in a little box and explore it later. Throw out what doesn't serve you. And if something is especially uncomfortable that you may want to look at later, just you know, do it when it feels like you could really take a look at it because I've been going myself through this process of decolonizing myself. And so I know it's not comfortable. So I'm not asking you to do something I haven't been doing myself. And I also have my friend Coyotl. And Coyotl is also from Mexico. And uh, he's a peyote road man. And uh, we met at the Mexica dances about a month ago or so. They happened to be passing through Colorado. And uh, a lot of what I've been saying is that it is time not just that we bring the medicine people, the lineage holders, into the conversation. That's not enough. We need to center them. They need to be leading these conversations, and I'll cover that too. So I'm very grateful that Coyotl was a yes to, um, I grabbed him in Boulder and I drove him all the way to Denver, and uh, I'm very happy to be able to include him in the conversations because this is who should be, this is the people that we should be listening to. 
are the people that are carrying these medicines. And so just by looking at you and your smiles, I have a feeling that I'll be preaching to the choir a little bit tonight. Um, but I hope that this message gets out and wide because it's, it's important what we're doing here today um, and we're, what we're doing in this movement will have an effect. Um, we're writing history. We're writing history right now. And it could go one way or another. And it's really up to us and how much we decide to advocate for the medicines um, and being in right relationship. So thank you for coming. Thank you for jumping in with me in these conversations. I will make some things lighter than others. Um, and uh, yeah, so let's just dive in. Uh, but before that, it would be really nice to start with a little bit of music, get us all in the same energy, and uh, then I'll tell you my story. permission to speak about the medicines that have been very important in my life, my teachers, my guides. I don't hold the altars of the medicines that have taught me so much. So I must ask permission to, to speak to those experiences. Um, I will also say that I do not speak for all indigenous peoples. I am Mastisa, as I said. And so, you know, when we say, this is what the indigenous people stand for, it's a little silly because there's a lot of indigenous people in the world. And uh, I would dare say that um, Indigeneity means a deep, deep connection with the land and a reverence. And I will be speaking today to the difference, the, the mindset that is a Western mindset and the indigenous mindset. And I apologize for the generalization, but I think it's, it's important to start the conversation somewhere. So I don't want to make it seem like all indigenous people think this way, but I have some a mindset that I think it's important for us to understand the difference. And I have heard a lot of people say, well, these medicines belong to all of us. These medicines are from the earth. And when we understand the mindset that we come from, when we're talking about these medicines, um, we will understand, I think, where, where, where we go wrong in that mindset when we're coming from a Western mindset. So that's why I will go into the indigenous mindset versus the Western mindset so that we understand um, the situation that we're in that I'm calling a world-class ethical dilemma and I'll tell you why. Um, I grew up, as I said, in Mexico City. Um, a lot of trauma in my family, a lot of instability. And uh, the first time I ran away from home, I was 10. And uh, I was almost kicked out of my house and I was like, well, really, I show you, I'll leave that kind of 10 year old, double Aries, very fiery. Um, 
And then the second time I ran away, I was 15, and I didn't come back. And I ended up in the streets of Mexico City for a while, um, having a lot of experiences that I probably shouldn't have had, uh, but I did, and they taught me a lot. And uh, I needed to get out of some tough situations down there. I didn't want to go back home to my mom, and my dad lived in California, so I sent him a letter. Back then, we wrote letters, and we put stamps in envelopes, and it took three weeks to get there. I know you young people are like, what? You did what? Yeah, it took a long time. Um, he sent me a telegram. I don't know if you remember telegrams, but he actually sent me a telegram and sent me a plane ticket, and off I went to LA, and I started a new life. And uh, in that process, I denied my history, I denied my culture, and because I wanted to forget it all, I did not know that I was throwing out the baby with the bathwater. I was throwing out a traumatic life with an amazing, rich, beautiful culture, but I did. And um, I went to school, I actually went to music school. I'm a flutist, flautist, I used to play the classical flute. Um, married a rocket scientist, believe it or not, and ended up in Washington, D.C. Um, and I allowed myself to be more and more and more colonized. What that means is that I really fell into the system. I fell into trying to fit in um, because that's what we were told we needed to do to fit in. And although this life allowed me to heal from a lot of things because this beautiful man who is now my ex-husband um, gave me enough stability for me to look at my trauma and for me to start healing some things. At the same time, I was re-traumatizing myself in very different ways because I was fitting into a system that I definitely did not fit into. Um, so eventually, um, I started hearing the word ayahuasca. And every time I heard that word, my skin would light up. And uh, I was going through a divorce. My son, I have two boys, and uh, my younger son was 17 at the time, and he said, out of the clear blue, we had never talked about plant medicine, he said, mommy, promise me one day we'll sit with ayahuasca together. And I was like, excuse me, what did you just say? And I said, what do you know about ayahuasca? And he goes, quite a bit, as a matter of fact. I've been researching. So, and I said, well, that medicine has been calling me and I am looking for her, and um, so I'll let you know how that goes. And so, I moved to Colorado. Um, after my divorce, after a few years, I moved to Colorado, and uh, I ended up fi um, finding someone that served ayahuasca in Vermont. And he was a white boy, really beautiful human, um, but he did not really come from a lineage. He had been working himself with ayahuasca for a while. Um, he hadn't really studied or was, he was not adopted by any indigenous traditions. He played beautiful recorded music. And that was my first experience with this medicine. It was very new agey. And, um, he would do a lot of eye gazing with his, with his participants, which ended up in a lot of um, attachments. And he made a whole mess of a big community. I was, we say in Spanish, brujería. And that basically means dark magic. I mean, there was a lot of energetic stuff going on that really should not be happening in a medicine ceremony. Um, and then I sat with an ayahuasca from Peru, and I realized a lot of things. I realized what I'd been missing, and I realized the importance of the roots, the roots to the earth and to the spirit world that get created when you come from a lineage, when you have studied, when you learn from your parents and they learn from their parents. Um, and then I went to Peru and I sat with this ayahuasquero for a 10-day dieta and uh, in the jungle, and I realized a lot more things. I, I saw the parts of me that were very white, the parts of me that were very colonized, the parts of me that, um, to be honest, the parts of me that were racist. I grew up in a very, um, I said, um, 
classist, but it's racist too. And I really had to look deeply at myself going like, damn, like I don't get this. I don't understand this, this plant medicines the way that I should. But there was a part of me, thank goodness I did have enough of an indigenous side that was saying, take a deeper look. Everybody doesn't get to serve this medicine. And there's a lot of harm that can be done by the weekend shamans. Um, so I, I kept working with the medicine, um, and then I started working with Los Niños Santos, the mushrooms that do come from my country, um, the Mazotex, uh, all the beautiful medicines. And the mushrooms told me, go back to Mexico, like reclaim your lineage, reclaim your blood, reclaim where you come from, reclaim the lands where you come from. So I did, I went to Oaxaca, I had a beautiful experience. Um, with a medicine woman that holds the lineage, um, the Mazotec lineage. And all of that helped me see how I had chopped some of my roots and I needed to regrow my roots and how important it is to have those roots to work with the medicine. And I'm very careful to not say that the medicine called me. And I'm going to tell you why, because I hear that a lot. I hear that a lot of people say, well, the medicine called me, the medicine told me I needed to serve the medicine. That's happening a lot, especially with people that don't have a lineage. And so the medicine called me to what? If the medicine is telling you, you should go serve medicine. This is like a calling. To see how much you got out of this? Other people can get something out of this too. That might mean go deep in your roots. Go look at where you come from. It may not mean go serve the medicine. Um, and so I say that because nowadays a lot of people are claiming that the medicine told them. And uh, without the roots, I'm telling you, from my experience, I saw it firsthand. Without the roots to a lineage, a lot of harm can be done a lot of harm. I saw two entire communities fall apart. I experienced it myself. I had to go fly to Vermont and, you know, I'm a life coach and a healer. And so I had to go help heal a mess created by someone that called themselves a medicine keeper because the medicine called them. So the medicine has a way of amplifying what's inside of us and Colonialism also has its own spirit, so sometimes the spirit of colonialism can get into our journeys and, you know, like do its thing, like go serve, go do this. Aggrandizing instead of humbling ourselves to something that has lineages for a reason, come from places where there's been ritual and ceremony for a reason. We traverse incredible dimensions with these medicines of the spirit world. And if we don't understand how to navigate them and how to help people, guess what? We can cause a ton of harm. And so, um, where we're going here in Colorado with what's happening with the medicines, and we're saying, you know, let's free the medicines. The medicines are free. The medicines have always been free in that they are beings, they're spirit beings. What we're actually trying to do now is put them inside a system and regulating them. We're, we're unfreeing the medicine actually by this um, movement that we're in the middle of. So it's good to think about that. Are we freeing the medicines or are we being told that we're freeing the medicines? But the truth is we're regulating the medicines and we're leaving out the people that are the stewards of these medicines. There are people that are the stewards of these medicines. Just in case you haven't heard, there are people that are actually the stewards of these medicines. And they're the ones that if anything is going to happen with these medicines, they're the ones that should be leading. Um, and that's not what's happening because, you know, we have our mindset. And so I'm going to get a little bit into the mindset that created this mess, in my personal opinion. Of course, you could take it or leave it. Don't think that I know everything because I don't. Uh, question everything I say and question everything other people say. Like, really tune into your own truth. Um, but I did a little research 
just to make a point, I came up with eight points that are the difference between the Western mindset and the indigenous mindset. And I'm not sure how I'm going to do this because I came up with little, um, little posters because underneath it all, I'm a teacher. I've been, I was a teacher for 20 years and I love the little um, ways to demonstrate things. So can I give you the mic? So I'm just going to speak loud. I don't think I need the mic. Is it okay if I don't use that mic? Okay. So I did a talk for NOAC Society, like, I don't know, six months ago, however, however long that was, and I called it Round Pegs and Square Holes. And so this is a little piece of that talk with a few visuals. I didn't have visuals that time. But we have, I didn't have a ball, so I, wrote a, I, I brought a melon. This is going to be a round peg. And I brought a square box. This is going to be our square hole. And we're going to talk a little bit about the difference. So I'm going to put on the square peg, or the square hole, I'm going to put the Western mindset. And let's just talk about the difference. In the Western mindset, they tell us to be skeptical, uh, scientific, and requiring proof as basis of belief. Now, this proof is a very particular Western proof, by the way, because these medicines have had proof that they work for millennia. But in the Western mindset, they tell us that it needs to be proof that fits into this box we call science. So I'm going to put it up here. So you guys over there will have to memorize it, because uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to put them right here. So. We're told that we need to be scientific, skeptical, and require proof as a basis of beliefs. But in the indigenous mindset, spirituality is based, it's a spiritually, spiritually based society. And we believe in the spiritual world. And guess what? The spiritual world will not fit in this thing we call science. So you see how right there already the round peg and the square hole are not going to jive very well. I, um, I'm part of a panel tomorrow for a conference, for a psychedelic conference at um, CU Denver, the Anschutz campus of CU Denver. And I was doing a little research about what they're doing. And they're doing, doing two studies with psilocybin, one for cancer and one for depression. And I was reading the study. And I really, I'm really bad at reading scientific papers. So I don't get most of what they're saying. Yeah, thank you. But what I noticed is that in the studies, of course, they can't study the spiritual part of this, right? They cannot study the ritual and the ceremony. They study the main ingredient, the psilocin, right, or, or the psilocybin. They, that's what they study, and then they see if it's um, effective. Well, guess what? They're taking out the magic juice. They're taking out the ritual and the ceremony and why these medicines work to do the studies to see if these medicines are effective. And this is why, because they, they tried to fit everything in that little box. And these medicines are part of they're spiritual beings. Um, how many people believe that their medicines are sentient beings? OK, that's a lot better than last week. I was in, a, in an event, and like three people raised their hand. So in the Western world, we have one truth based on science or Western-style law. Let's see if I can join them together. Let's see if they stay. And in the spiritual world, we have many truths that have to do with your individual experience. We're not going to try to fit everything in a square box.
In the Western world, we have a compartmentalized society, and it's becoming more and more and more compartmentalized. Everything needs to fit in certain places, right? If you have a problem with your kidneys, only your kidneys get looked at because, of course, they're separate from everything else, right? They're just the kidneys. I mean, that's what they believe. Like, we, we compartmentalize everything. Everything is separate, and that is the mindset. And that, by the way, is what's happening with our medicines. Let's take the psilocybin out of the mushrooms and let's put them in capsules and let's try to have people heal from their separation to the earth and the colonization and all the things that we've done by putting them in a clinic in four white walls. I don't know what you think about that, but I think it's not exactly going to work. Um, we, as Einstein said, we cannot solve a problem with the level of energy that created it. And I happen to believe that a lot of our problem is what I'm pointing out right now, this, this mindset of compartmentalizing and separating ourselves from the earth, separating ourselves from the mother. Um, look up the definition of nature in the dictionary and you'd be amazed. It says something like, um, everything including the landscape to the exception of humans. It actually says that. Like, Google it. I'm not joking. When I read that, I was like, this is the entire problem. We've separated ourselves from the mother. And now we're trying to separate things from the mother to try to help us connect again. It doesn't, <laughs> it's not going to work that way, I don't think. Um, in the indigenous mindset, people, objects, and the environment are all connected. Law, kinship, and spirituality reinforce this connectedness. The identity comes from connection. The plant spirits are part of who we are. They are our kin. So it would never occur to us to extract them and colonize them and exploit them and not respect them and put them in laws and regulations. We wouldn't do that because they are brothers and sisters. And when people say, but the plants belong to all of us, I ask, does your mother belong to you? Do your kids belong to you? They don't belong to anybody. They belong to the ecology of this world that we've created. But it's, it's not about owning. It's about communing and relating. So when we're talking about our relationship to what's happening to our plant medicines and regulating them, we're literally regulating our siblings. Just think about that for a minute. And I sometimes take it a step further and say, if these plants are spirits and they don't have a voice, but we're doing whatever the heck we want with them, doesn't that kind of sound like slavery? Just think about that for a minute. So we also have the land and its resources should be available for development and extraction for the benefit of humans. That's what we've been told. That's what we're living, right? Like we want to build a house, we chop all the trees down. We build a house without thinking much about it because that's what we do. They're for our benefit, right? When some of my ancestors and maybe some of yours came from Europe, they decided that the land should belong to them. And we kicked out the stewards of this land and this is what we've created because that's the mindset, that it's for us. So that right there shows you we're separate from it because if we saw it as our kin, we wouldn't do this. But it takes for us to separate ourselves from the land for us to be able to exploit it. So it's a handy, it's a handy belief so that we can commercialize, capitalize, you know, follow the, the capitalistic ways.
So within the indigenous views, the land is sacred and usually given by a creator or supreme being. If we really saw it like the land is sacred, the land is sacred, our plant medicines are sacred, we would probably be in a very different place than we are now. Don't mess with the altar. So in the Western mindset, time is usually linearly structured and future oriented. The framework of months, years, days, etc., reinforce a linear structure. And I was reading something, well, I, I was looking at a video today, something really, really scary that talks about our um, plant medicines are being actually taken over by Silicon Valley because they're looking, they really want to enhance productivity so that we can get to a world that is more um, technology based. And we're looking at the generations in the future when we literally, they said this words, colonize space. And this is like a good thing. At Silicon Valley, they're like, let's colonize space. Because we've messed this up, and so let's you know go mess something else up because we can't handle what we've created here. So anyway, that was really scary. That's going to work. So, in the indigenous mindset, time is nonlinear and cyclical in nature. Time is measured in cyclical events. The seasons are centered to the cyclical concept. So, again, this is connection with nature, right? Connection with what happens in the stars, what happens in the seasons, the foods that we grow, the foods that we eat, it's cyclical in that way, it's not linear. Now this is a good one, feeling comfortable in the Western mindset is related to how successful you feel you have been in achieving your goals. So, you know, society is telling us that we need to be super productive, right? Productive, 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 productive. And that's what's happening in Silicon Valley. People are hired to be mega productive and now they're using psychedelics to try to make them more productive so that they could be in the system. I was interviewed by somebody that is writing an article. We were talking to somebody recently. What's the name of it? Fast Company. Fast Company. And they wanted to get our opinion on the use of psilocybin for productivity. And, you know, I wanted to run in the other direction. Like, really? Now you're going to use our plant medicines to go into the system so that we could just go around the hamster wheel faster for your benefit? And it was moms. Moms were using this medicine, or are using this medicine, so they can juggle everything that is in front of them and appear as if nothing is happening. In the indigenous mindset, feeling comfortable has more to do with our relationships. The quality of your relationships with people, and by people we don't only mean human people, we mean all the people the tree people and the rock people and the sun and the moon and the stars and the mountain people in the Andean cosmology that I study. The spirit of the mountains are called Apus and I make offerings to my Apus every day because they support me, they support the work that I do. And so my relationship with the spirit world is important for the work that I do. So we don't just relate to each other, we relate to those little ants that are on those pictures because they are our siblings too. Um, 
oh, it's called ant life, by the way, and those pictures are ant hills and ant caves. And so, you know, those are our siblings too, they're listening. Hi, little ants. Um, okay, let me put that one up. I'm running out of space, but I'm gonna put it over here. Okay, I'm almost done with this part of the presentation, I promise. So in Western mindset, they also convince us that humans are the most important in the world. So you could see how if humans are the most important in the world, then of course we get to do whatever we want with our medicines, right? We get to create new medicines, we get to do whatever we want because it's all about us. We are centered in this picture and so we should get whatever we want and grab whatever we want because we are most important. I hope you can see the issues that, that might create. Well, you could probably imagine that in the, in the indigenous mindset, human beings are not the most important in the world. We have a whole spirit world that we answer to and connect with. And this is where we create a spirit plate and this is where we make offerings. Um, and by the way, those of you who do, if there are any, anybody here, ceremonialist people that serve medicine, you know, the reason we have deep connections with the spirit world is because often, have you ever seen people call the directions? I've been to many events, especially those in Boulder, who people just call the directions like they're at your beck and call, and we call them, and of course they're gonna come and they're gonna help me, right? Because they're spirits that I get to just summon when I want. And the truth is, if you don't have a relationship with those spirits, it's not gonna be the same. And I will give you an analogy, because I love analogies. If you move to a new house and you never really met your neighbors and then all of a sudden you need to go out of town and you need your neighbors to watch your dog and then you just go knock on the door and say, hey, could you watch my dogs for the weekend and you don't have a relationship with them, why should they say yes? You probably want to bring in brownies and invite them over for dinner and have conversations over the weekends and develop a relationship before you ask a favor, right? Well, the spirit world is no different. They are people, they're just not embodied. So make sure that you're creating a relationship with the spirits and you're making a lot of offerings and you're getting to know them before you ask them any favors. Just saying. Okay, the last one on this side. Amassing wealth is for personal gain. That's what we're told, right? Make a lot of money, make more money, I should be abundant, it's all for me. And well, my friends and my family, but mainly like it's for me to keep. So we're told that it is very important that we make tons and tons of money. And of course, it's gonna be hard to do that unless we're in the top tier of society, which is hard to do. And in the indigenous mindset, amassing wealth is important for the good of the community because we are community-based. We are hopefully doing this for each other. And if you're down, then I'm not up until you're up too. Like we all rise together because we are a community and we are you know, working with and for each other, which if we were coming at this movement that we're calling the psychedelic movement, which I also have a problem with that word, but that's for another presentation. Um, let's talk about equity for a minute. I'm just gonna put this one down. So if I'm calling the indigenous mindset the round peg, and I'm calling the Western mindset the square hole, at some point, the square hole came over and decided that the round peg was uncivilized, not worthy of looking at, let's just push him away. 
And they kind of got on top of them, and they've tried really hard to disappear them, which, by the way, they're still around. So be careful not to talk about the indigenous people in past tense. But they've definitely been marginalized, and their lands have been taken away. And then the people from the Western mindset realized that not only living with those premises of separating yourself from the earth, amassing wealth, being all for ourselves, was causing anxiety and depression and all kinds of diseases. And I, I believe that the disease that we have in this society comes from inequality and from our separation from the earth. And that has created racism and that has created more of the cancer. But then we've decided, wait a minute, we're so sick, we need to heal. Let's look and see what these people down here have. Oh, they have plant medicines. They have, they have spirit. Wait, we're missing spirit. Let's go to their ceremonies. Let's go connect. And then, you know, somebody decides that they go to Peru and they feel so good in that ceremony and they're connected to the spirit. Oh, this is where it's at. And then you grab their medicine and you bring it over here and then you're going to serve their medicine because you must heal the world. The problem is that this medicine did not come from your own roots. So you're uprooting and we're culturally appropriating because it felt so good for a minute because there was your DNA recognizes truth. Your DNA recognizes connection with the mother. But we can't take our connection to the mother from a different culture. We could try and people do, but that creates more harm. So, you know, we're still looking and going like, okay, now we could take the medicines because they belong to everybody, right? Because with that mindset, you know, everything belongs to me because I want it, because, you know, I can extract it. And so, in my opinion, what's happening right now with the medicine is that we're coming from a Western mindset and we're going into the spirit world of medicine and instead of saying, yo, there are people here that have been doing this for millennia and if I want to get into this medicine space, I need to kind of get out of the way because I've kind of messed this whole thing up and I need to get out of the way and I need to shut up and I need to listen and I need to heal myself and I need to let them lead. But if I come from that mindset and I'm still like this, and then, by the way, a lot of people now say, well, equity means everybody gets a seat on the table. But guess what? When you've done this for such a long time, and you're the ones on top, and you're the ones calling the shots, equity doesn't mean, let me get a couple of indigenous looking people and have them have a chair so that they could say a couple things. That's not what equity looks like. So this is hard to say, but you know, equity in this movement means I'm going to get out of the way. I'm actually going to let go of my privileges for a minute and my ideas that everything belongs to me and that I, my comfort is based on extracting and you know getting everything I need and I may need to be uncomfortable for a while and let this other mindset have a lot more space right now because we've had space for the past 500 years we've pushed them away so equity may look like get out of the way be really humble really humble and that's hard because our mindsets are colonized. We've been told that we needed to be comfortable. I remember going to Mexico and talking to a Mayan person and then having them say a few things. And in my mind, I was like, oh yeah, he, he just doesn't get it. Like, that's how colonized my mind was. Like me saying to them, oh, they, they just don't get it. And so I bet we all have thoughts like that. Oh, they just don't get it. Oh, the medicine should be free for everybody. Oh, you know, they belong to all of us. It's time that we question where all those thoughts come from, that these plants belong to all of us. 
the people from the indigenous mindset have been working with this medicine for a very long time. And they don't belong to all of us. And I want to tell you my, my stance on peyote, a lot of people have asked me if I have sat with peyote in peyote ceremony. Take a little water. And the answer is I have not. And the reason I have not sat in peyote ceremony is because it's not my medicine. It's not the medicine of my people. People in Mexico, the Huicholes or the Huiraricas, they hold those altars. But I haven't been invited up there. And something inside me always said, that medicine is sacred. And it doesn't matter how curious you are, it doesn't belong to you. And it's also a medicine that is endangered. There's a lot of industry in Texas and the north of Mexico that are taking away large chunks of land where this medicine grows. And by the way, the people that say, well, it's, that's easy to solve, right? Let's just create greenhouses with peyote. I will, let some, I will let Coyle talk a little bit more about that because I cannot speak for that medicine. But I can speak to my experience. Something inside me, once I started rooting myself in my culture and my lineage, I realized, don't take what is not yours. Don't take out of curiosity or out of awakening something that is sacred, that people count on for a long time. So I just invite us all to think about that. Do the medicine really belong to all of us? Or are there medicines that we need to leave alone no matter how curious we are about them? There are medicines that were created in these territories. I don't have any problems with MDMA, ketamine, LSD. Those are medicines that are beautiful medicines too. They're synthetic and they're very different. But, you know, let's look at who should really be holding space for each of these medicines and who we choose to sit with when we go to ceremonies. Do we sit with somebody that just went down somewhere and went to a few retreats and decided that, to bring the ceremonies? Or do we actually go find out who are the lineage holders of these medicines? And when we go, by the way, if we do go to Peru or to Mexico or to the different places where these medicines are being, beautiful ceremonies are being held, if we go with that mindset, you're not going to get that much out of it. If we're really going to learn the mindset that is deeply connected with the earth and really learn, we need to drop our arrogance and go really with, I don't know, and I'm here to learn, and I'm going to watch, and I'm going to listen, and believe me, they do things very differently than you would expect. It's not going to be a catered ceremony in Costa Rica in a plushy retreat center where you'll have everything you need and beautiful organic foods and beautiful bathrooms and hammocks and rivers to swim in, and it's, it's not going to be that. If you're going to go to a ceremony, you may have to sit all night without going to the bathroom. You may have to learn to have a spine. You may learn to connect with the earth in a very different way. Is that wrong? Our mind might tell us that because we're programmed. It's okay. But, it's, but we need to look at it like, oh, that's my colonized mind that is making this wrong because I'm not used to it. So. With that, I have a few questions for our beautiful roadmap who is here um, to tell us a little bit about um, your medicine, Coyotl, how you came to the medicine. And um, Coyotl was telling us um, what Canada is doing with peyote. Maybe you could share a little bit about that. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Coyot Shupainali. I'm from Mexico City. Uh, my lineage is, uh, they call us Aztecs, but we actually call ourselves uh, Mexica. And, and my, and my um, personal tribe, I'm Xochimilca, which is uh, another uh, one of the seven tribes of the Aztecs. But we come, I'm come from Mexico City, South Mexico City. 
But I came to Canada uh, about 20 years ago and then I started learning about the medicine ways and um, um, I've been part of a, uh, what is called a Native Canadian Church, which is uh, based on uh, Red Faison, uh, Saskatchewan. And I've been part of uh, um, their ceremonies with, with my, I call them brothers, the Crees. I'm Aztec, like I said, and, uh, and but I believe they're, uh, we're like cousins. I found so many similarities in the language, and, and, uh, and when I found out that they eat medicine, it was even more. I was like, holy smokes, the medicine came all the way to Canada. But it did, actually. It came to Canada on the uh, 1940s, like a while ago. And they had a, they had a, a very uh, strong connection with the medicine, I guess. The, the, they started having um, meetings with, with different roadmans that came from south and from Rocky Boy. And then eventually they started uh, having their own uh, fireplaces. They call it inter travel fireplaces. But I guess it's, um, it's a medicine that's been helping our people from north and south. Um, I believe it's been an immigration. It is, it's been an immigration. Before the invaders came, it was all one land from Alaska to Nicaragua. And uh, we've been here for 15,000 years, the Utah Aztecs. So we actually came from Michigan. They found some. Uh, some uh, temples in, in, in Michigan. So that's uh, what they believe the Aztecs came and they, we immigrated south on the 1,000 years ago. And then we, uh, less than 1,000. And then we, f we found the uh, Mexico Tenochtitlan. So that means that we immigrated south, but we actually, we could say we were even, even more north than Colorado. <laughs> and they say that medicine used to grow all the way to Colorado, this, this uh, peyote. And, um, and it's been helping many, many nations ever since the, it, it was brought to north again, I guess. Uh, like I said, it's been always an immigration north and south. And I have, I have a really uh, precise information that uh, I got from, from friends that how the medicine was brought to, to north by Quanah Parker and other um, members, they started actually the Native American Church from U.S. So it's a, it's a little bit how the medicine started from the early 1900s and it went all the way to Canada. Uh, Quanah Parker was the first one that actually went and talked with uh, White House and with uh, all the politicians and he actually made the protection to the medicine through the through the Religion Act. So it's kind of how the, the peyote has been protected <clears throat> ever since those days. And, uh, and they, they, they started making uh, churches all over, Native American churches all over Oklahoma, and then it started expanding all the way to Canada. But the funny thing is that somehow in Canada, it's more protected than in the United States and even in Mexico. In Mexico, sometimes, the, well, the only tribe that is allowed to travel with it and to use it is the Huichol tribe. But even in Mexico, sometimes they get, uh, they get arrested just uh, if they get into a checking point. Sometimes the federal, the police or the military, they even arrest them even though they have the paperwork. But in Canada, as long as you're native and you, you hold a status card, you can consume the medicine and transport it, but under the Religion Act too. And it's because they had this meeting on, on 1944 and, uh, and Mosquito, they had, a, <clears throat> they had a conference and then they brought some officials from the government and they had a meeting. And, and those officials that sat up with, uh, with, with uh, my, my brother, I called my brother Kelly Daniels, He's, uh, he was the president of the Native Canadian Church uh, about a couple of years ago. He was there for like 
many years, but his, his grandfather was the one conducted a ceremony and they brought those officials from Canada and then they showed them how they do the ceremonies, how they take care of this, this peyote medicine. And those officials, when, when they went in and they, they were part of the ceremony, it's like they blow their minds and after that they, they say, well, where are we going to sign? We, this is beautiful, this is, this is very, um, very powerful and, and we don't want to stop you from, from healing and from continuing this medicine way, this way of prayer, this way of uh, taking care of your own nation. So they sign up those papers and ever since the medicine has been legal in Canada and and the, but they did, they did mention that they, they had to just hold the medicine just to the native people. Like there was, there's, there was not going to be any, um, uh, like if, if a not person, that, uh, not native person was holding medicine, they could get arrested or they could get um, in trouble because the, the papers they sent it was only for the native people. So, and ever since to the those those uh, Cree nation, and um, and those Stony too, the, the from Alberta, and the surrounding areas, they they didn't allow any not native people to come into their ceremonies, and that's how the way we've been keeping it. And it's been pretty kept pretty pretty strong, and there's there's hand hasn't been any infiltration and in, in not much in Canada, but... Let me ask you a question. Yeah. I'll get really close because there's two mics. So why is it important that the medicine is kept for the indigenous people? Oh yeah, that's... that's be, um, well... Um, in my own experience, um, it's because the lineage that we that we carry, right? So the um, if we go to Mexico, those uh, the Wicholis, the 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 Wiradica, they've been using this medicine for over eight thousand years. So they must know something about this medicine, right? Because they've been carrying it for eight thousand years, and they their whole life is it, it goes around the medicine. They use it for everything for. Uh, for cultivating their, their, their food, everything goes around the medicine and goes the same to the Mohawks, to all the nations that use the, the peyote. So it's important, it's, it's what we keep, the, the connection with, uh, like what she was saying, with the spirits and with, uh, with the offerings that we make. Like we, we just don't go and just take the peyote and just hand it as a, like as a potato or something, right? <laughs> just kick it out of the land and just grab it and throw it in a sack and just mail it somewhere, which is actually happening in the gardens of Texas. Uh, some of the so-called dealers, they're actually just use, doing it for money, right? Because this, this medicine grows in their land and they just go and kick it out of the ground and just throw it as, as a potato. And then they, they sell it, and they make money out of it. But that against Mexico, where we actually have to have some, some deer blood, and then we have to offer it to the land before we even pick it. So we have like this, um, they call it the, the deer hunt. So we go for days walking, and then we make offerings. Then we go offer to the different areas on Wirikuta. And then finally, when, when we're ready, couple days, maybe three days after doing all the, our offerings, then we finally go to the, where the medicine is. And then it's a whole process. We got to find a family. And then and when we find the family, we, we make a hole. And then we put candles. We put uh, little, um, little gores with peyote, um, peyote work. And then we put uh, money. We put more blood. and. We leave candles and we sing, we pray. So all that has to happen before we even touch the medicine, the, the peyote. So that's how much um, love and respect we have for this peyote. With the, some of our people, they call it mother peyote or grandpa peyote, but I think it's, it doesn't have a, 
It's both, right? <laughs> I'm just going to talk very close to you. Um, you may you may have noticed that in the regulations they excluded peyote um, to protect the peyote, but they left mescaline as a medicine that is being legalized. Um, and what Coyotl just described happens also with the Huachuma or the San Pedro, which is the other medicine that has mescaline. And uh, I study the Andean cosmology, so I go to the south a lot, and I commune with this beautiful medicine of um, Huachuma. And my teacher, the last time I was there, my teacher was very concerned, and she said, there, there are people from the north that are coming down and trying to buy huge plots of land in Peru or in Bolivia so that they can extract mescaline from the medicine. And so the process that Coyotl just described with the peyote and how they make offerings of blood, this medicine is sacred medicine. And that's, I think, the piece that gets missed when we're like, let's free the medicine and everybody should get access. This is a sacred, sacred medicine. When I was in Bolivia last year to collect enough medicine for four of us to have ceremony, we had to make little offerings. We had to get some fat from the llamas and some cotton and some wool that came from the llamas also and offered coca leaves that were preyed on and we had to make chicha which took us a couple of days so that we could put the chicha in the offering. And then a few days after we did all that, then we had to hike the mountain and then we had to ask permission from the Wachuma plants which one was going to donate some of the Wachuma for the ceremony. And then we cut a piece, just enough medicine for what we needed, no more. And then we prayed, and then we took it down into town, and then we had to, um, the Wachuma has a lot of uh, thorns, so we had to peel the medicine, and it took us a couple of days to dry the medicine, and finally, a week later, we did our ceremony. Imagine what happens when we legalize mescaline, and somebody decides, I'm a big investor, so I'm just going to go down to Peru and do a Wachuma farm. And guess who I'm going to hire? I'm going to hire the local people and pay them 10 bucks an hour, maybe five, to basically chop the heads off of their medicine. And I'm going to pay them so that I can bring that mescaline to the States. And basically, because they, they'll need the money, I can tell them to just chop the medicine, a ton of it, because I'll need a ton of it. Like, that's what's happening. This is why this movement is so important to us, because let's say that we did protect the peyote, which by the way, people are not going to know where the mescaline comes from, and peyote is definitely endangered, and we should definitely leave it alone. But say that we did leave it alone, the other medicines are endangered too, because in order to cover the need of these medicines, we need a lot of medicine. And if this happened, if people went down there, and just bought land and basically raped the medicine in that way. This is dangerous. So thank you for sharing about that. Um, I think we should open up to a question and answer. If you don't mind, you repeat the question. Yes, I'll repeat the question. So when people are detribalized, um, and in, in the case of the Taino, where the tribe doesn't exist anymore, um, how to find the true calling of the medicine, is that right? Yes have to find if it's, this is a true calling. And uh, thank you for the question, by the way. It's a beautiful question. I think that um, there are ways for us to find our connection to the land and our ancestors that may not be at the physical level. And I think that the work that you're doing, decolonizing the work is beautiful. And through those roots and through those offerings, I believe the medicine will guide you. Um, but the the wisdom from your ancestors lives in your bones. Make a lot of offerings and do a lot of prayer and get in the right relationship with your lineage, even if they're not around anymore. That would be my answer. Um, I also work with Daniel, who a lot of people know is good to me. Uh, they do a lot of work to help people find their lineage and their roots, and I'd be happy to connect with them because they do a lot of that work. So there are ways as long as we come with a lot of respect and Mama is our connector. 
on the earth, and there's a lot of ways to make offerings. Thank you for the question. Oh, yeah. yeah, I just want to say, um, yeah, it's like when you're connecting with this, the medicines, you connect with your ancestors too, right? And I think you, we have to um, kind of investigate definitely what are our medicines. Like I was told that the, the, the ceremony of the sapo, the, the it's not even uh, indigenous. It's it's been a uh, style from somebody that was not native. So I would suggest to to find from your land which which plants were grown there and how they, they used to use them. Like every nation has its own plants, its own medicines. That's why I believe every one of us should find our own medicines. Like. Uh, us and the Aztecs and the Wichol, we have the peyote and, and I believe you guys should leave us with our medicines. And if you want to be part of it, you have to come in a respectful way and then we'll kind of uh, uh, prepare you for, for it. And, but I already know that there's a lot of native uh, people that are running also peyote ceremonies and that's kind of going, uh, they already took our land, they already took everything, and now they want to take even our, our ceremony. So that's kind of going, uh, or already casting all the waters, right? Uh, they're trying to take our, our ceremonial ways. And, and there's some people that are actually even uh, making money or profit out of our medicines. The, this guy that's going to Mexico and he's buying the peyote from the Wicholes and he comes the United States and Canada, he sells it for twice or, or more of uh, what he gets it, and he's just profiting it out of the peyote. And not just that, he, the, he's just kind of uh, taking too much medicine and then selling it to even not native, people, not native ones. Because I've seen some uh, on a dispensary in Vancouver, I've seen uh, some peyote buttons and uh, how they were selling it and for 50 bucks a button. And I think that's the point that we don't want to come to. We want to be able to like separate wherever it is for recreational and wherever it is traditional. So the peyote should be traditional and the mescaline too. You, you, you shouldn't be taking any of those elements out of our medicines. You should leave it alone and leave it sacred. That's how the, the, the people of the fireplaces they always said just when you come to pray to the, on these fireplaces, they're sacred and just keep it sacred. Don't try to abuse it and take it. Just take some peyote and, and go to a hill and study medicine in your own way. And then you, you don't know what, what you're going to expect. You know you don't have anybody to help you, right? So it's always a purpose to, to eat the medicine. That's why it's important to find your own medicines. If, if uh, the ones that are they're not from these lands, you should go find your own medicines and your opens wherever you came from, right? Everybody has his own medicines and you respect the ones that are here from this land or from your land. And, and we have to, that's why we're trying to protect them because we don't want them to uh, prostitute it and start kind of opening it to the world and then all of a sudden we're, no, none of us are going to have any medicine left because they're taking it in the wrong way as, a, as, a, as a, a commercializing it and using it as, as a drug or as a, anything else. But the medicine should, should be eaten in, in, in ceremony, just in ceremonies. That's why we have these ceremony ways. Even the ayahuasca too, or any other medicines. There are some people that are even doing ceremonies and not even giving them the medicine. I heard somebody, some people in Canada, they're, supposed to be ayahuasca or any other ceremonies and then actually giving them synthetic stuff and then one of my bros actually passed away because he started eating so much of that and he didn't even know if, if it was this or that and he died and two, two other ones got kind of their mind lost so we have to understand that if they're not doing it right then something's going to happen to those people because they're not they're not doing a, a traditional ceremony so Thank you.
Evan wants to know if there is a place for the synthetic medicines in order to preserve the natural medicines um, if people want to have healing experiences. Is that right? Yeah, like in the, in the example of the Bufo Arias Code, like many ecologists that study the Sonoran Desert have advocated for folks to stop using the toad because there is no ethical way of consuming that medicine from the toad that doesn't involve harming the toad and their migration routes. But there's still a lot of people that want to use it. But there's been like safe synthetic uh, medicines created that are the exact same molecules by the MDMT, and those ecologists are advocating for people to actually use the synthesized version because it's producing the same effects, but it's not actually harming our earth or the toads themselves. So. Right, so we're talking about the, the, the use of medicines such as the toads synthetically um, so that they reduce ecological risks. I'll speak to the toad because it's a medicine that I work with very deeply, and then I will pass the mic for the other medicines. Um, there actually is a way to collect toad medicine without hurting the toad, but not at the rate in which it's being, um, you know, there's so much more interest that now there's a lot more being collected, and now it's a risk. When it was just a few people going, and I have gone down to Sonora and have seen how they collect the medicine, and the toad, you sing to the toads, and then you extract them, and then you let them go, and then 15 days later they regrow that medicine, but, now the way they're doing it is the, the cartels are involved in now producing carbon neo DMT. So from the perspective of the toad, I think it's a good idea to go to the synthetic. Um, I have not experienced the synthetic enough to I'm, I'm working on deciding if I if it's the same effect. Um, I have, you know, the medicine that I have is the medicine that comes directly from the tribe that was collected with um, Integrity. So, um, in that case, I think with vitamin DMT, it's a good idea to go to synthetic. But I don't feel the same way with all the medicines, for sure, because we are working with spirits. We're working. We're connecting with plant spirits, and the whole point is the ritual and the ceremony of the plant spirit. So, I will let you talk about. I think um, I agree with that. Uh, we should. Uh we still keep the ceremony away part of it. Um, I think when incidents have happened is because there was no uh, actual uh, guidance. So if, if you're using these this, um, synthetic ones, you're still kind of using a recreational even if, even though you're, um, you're using it, but it's nobody there to help you to to if you get into a situation, that's that's what I think is happening with many places. They're, they're using synthetic ones and nobody's around to help them and, and then they lose their mind and something happens on their health. So I think you should still kind of have the ceremony always. Um, um, either way, it should be like a recreational and then the ceremony. I don't know how they do. I don't smoke marijuana, but they, they usually have uh, different grades, right? So people don't don't get too too much of it and and get uh, unhealthy. Yeah, I I like to answer that question also from another perspective. I as I said earlier, I really do believe. Am I close enough to that mic? I'll just go ahead. I really do believe that the problem that we're in, the health, the mental health crisis, and the reason we need to heal is because we've separated ourselves from the earth and because we are just extracting that whole mindset that I described over there is more of the problem, which may not be solved by taking medicine, synthetic or otherwise. Um, I would love to lead people to, to ceremonies that are mainly offerings to the land and deepen in that. We can all do that. I learned in the Ways of the Andes, which is the, the despacho, but we can all make offerings to the land every day, and I promise you a lot of healing will come from that. If we explore our own roots, if we are making offerings to the earth, if we reconnect with the mother, maybe we need less medicine. I don't think necessarily 
that our plant medicines are going to solve all, all our problems and are going to heal the health crisis and the cancers. Because that's a top-down approach. Oh, you have this problem? Let's put something on top of it to heal it. How about we go find out why there's a problem to begin with? Why don't we go find out the cancer is coming from, maybe I'm overworked, maybe I'm deep into the capitalistic system and I'm being exploited. And let's just change the systems. That's where we need to be spending our time and our energy because the systems are what's making, what are making us sick. And the ayahuasca or mushrooms or cannabis, none of this is going to have the ability to heal as long as we change something and that something is whatever created the disease to begin with. So, you know, can we use synthetics? Yeah, maybe we can go into that conversation, but it's still top-down approach. There's something that is making us really sick. Let's go there, in my opinion. And offerings to the earth, offerings to the land is a really good place to start that is actually quite simple. We can all do that when we get home tonight. Yeah, so she's asking how to be in right relationship with the medicine. Um, and like with ayahuasca, there's a lot of people that do a lot of medicine ceremonies, like 50 ceremonies, and yeah, people are holding badges now. <laughs> I did 10 rounds of mushrooms! Woo! You know, I did 50 ayahuasca ceremonies. Like, you know, it's not a competition. And that's from that mindset, that, you know, that's the Western mindset, right? More is better and all of that. Um, I do have an opinion, and I have to be careful because I cannot speak for medicines that are not my medicine. Ayahuasca is not my medicine. She's a big teacher that um, I commune with quite a bit, but I don't hold the altar for ayahuasca. But, um, yeah, let me pass the mic. I, I, I may say something. Yeah, let's say something. I think that's a great question. And what I would say is, if you look at a plant as a sentient being, Right, as a being like you and I, with a soul, with emotions, with a heart, with a mind. What's the right way to be in relationship with somebody that is next to you? Can you go in and sleep with them 50 times and not do anything else and then still claim that you have a relationship with them? You can't, right? So treat this medicine like you want to be treated. If you don't want to be used, then don't use them. If you don't want to be exploited and trafficked, then don't do that to them. Because that's, that's at the bottom of it. These are sentient beings, just like you and I. And when we're using something for my benefit, is that a two-way relationship? Or is that just, it's whatever I gain and I don't care about you? If you put two humans in that relationship, you will define it as abuse. Right? So that's something to think about. How can I be in right relationship with a plant? Don't treat it like something that is disposable or something that is just there when you need it. Create right relationship, nourish that relationship. Anna talks about offerings, you know? If you have a friend, how do you continue that friendship? By showing up, by being there. Whether it's in the sad times or in the happy times. That's how you create good relationships with humans, and that's how you create really good relationships with spirits and sentient beings. Thank you. And there's also the altar that you choose to work with. You know, if you go sit in the Huni Queen altar, with ayahuasca, they may have their protocols and they may direct you to how to work with the medicine. If you sit with Yahe, with you know someone from the from Colombia, then they have their way to work with the medicine. They have their dietas, and then so especially when we're talking about plant medicines with lineages like ayahuasca, choose who you sit with. Sit with someone with that lineage, and then follow their guidance because we're also trying to make a lot of decisions for medicines that are not ours on how to even sit with them. But there are people that come here that have those lineages. If you're gonna to choose to work with them with that medicine, 
listen and follow the guidance because everybody will have their own way. Tell us about the other way. Yeah, I think it's um, with the peyote, it's, it's hard to abuse it because it's real, the flavor is so strong and so it's its own protection, right? So that's how when our, our elders always tell us, okay, well, if you, if you feel like you want to get well, then just come to a ceremony and eat as much as you, your body can handle, right? And the medicine itself has its own protection, that's the, one of them is the flavor. And also the other one is the, the peyote is never going to get you addicted. It's one of those medicines that won't get you addicted. You, you, it's more likely that if you go to the peyote ceremony, you will never want to come back. <laughs> <laughs> so that's like a really good protection, right? Like so, sometimes I sit up there and I'm like, what I'm doing here is so hard to sit up and, and pray for somebody, right? And the, and the most important too that I believe is we always have an intention. We, we don't just do it, oh yeah, let's go set up a tipi on, on the highest hill and let's just get higher. Right? It's not about that. It's, we we have, always have an intention. It's, it's either somebody sick or somebody needs help. And we all help the person on, on their prayers. So it's always a meaning. There's always something to pray for. It's nothing just to go and sit and eat medicine as much as you can. And the medicine itself will teach you how much you need, how much. And, and basically the ones we're there were just to protect you that, that you don't overdo it and, and kind of, it's like a kind of, like we just kind of make the traffic go peacefully like, like that. Everybody, follows a protocol, but actually the teacher is the medicine. We believe that the medicine itself is going to tell you when you're going to stop, how much you're going to need, and it's depending how you approach the medicine, that's, that's how the... It, it, if you're going to approach it as a medicine, it's going to be your, it's a medicine for you and it's going to heal you, but if you want to approach it as a, as a drug, it's going to treat you like, it's going to slap you and and you're gonna feel like you're, you're dying. I've seen people that just start even phone coming out of their mouth and stuff because that's the approach they wanted to have. They wanted to go and get high. And that's the medicine that's giving them a lesson, right? And I don't believe the medicine ever gonna get you addicted. I, I never feel like, like sometimes it takes months, sometimes years for me to go to a ceremony. Sometimes we have ceremonies every weekend. And it's all depending on the whatever is happening with our people, with our community. Sometimes we need a lot of prayers, and we set up TP. Even sometimes we have conferences. We we sit up for three or four nights, like straight, and just how much we, prayers we need. But you're never gonna get addicted to it. That's I guarantee that. Thank you. That's Shoshana, and she's asking um, for people without a lineage. Uh, working with cannabis and other synthetics, like what is recommended to do? Is that right? Yeah. To um, be yeah, to be better. Um, I happen to think that MDMA and ketamine are beautiful tools for Western minds. I work with ketamine and with MDMA myself because it really does open hearts. Um, of course, I bring my own flavor to it. And I do ritual and ceremony with MDMA because I think the ritual and the ceremony is an important part of the healing. Um, but that is Western medicine for Western people. And um, done right with a lot of love and compassion and even good relationship. You know, even MDMA comes from an oil, from the sassafras oil. And, you know, these this molecules can have their own spirits too. It's very different from the plant spirits. But we can work with those medicines and bring a lot of our own heart into it. And at the same time, concurrently with that, do your own work of finding your lineage and finding your roots. Um, and because the deeper, the deeper rooted you are with your own lineage. And a lot of, whenever I say that, some people say, well, what if I'm adopted? Or, um, there are ways to find your lineage 
with a medicine, even ketamine, believe it or not, um, where you could ask to connect yourself to your lineage. And they could start leading us to that. It doesn't need to be, you know, like knowing how to get a hold of a family tree. That'd be great if we have access to that, but a lot of people don't have access to that, or their parents may not know. You know, because a lot of lineages have been broken and people have been uprooted. But the medicines can help you also find your lineages and find your people. And the more rooted you are, I believe, even if you're working with ketamine, MDMA, LSD, um, those are beautiful medicines too. Those are the Western medicines, I believe, that is fine um, to use those. In a clinical setting with therapists, we forget the power of ritual. I bet you the amount of money every single person here has a ritual, whether it's in the morning when they wake up and they make the coffee, or when it's at night when they're getting ready to go to bed. And notice what happens to your nervous system when you are doing those actions. Everything just relaxes. You know, if you meditate, if you breathe, if you run, if you do exercise, that's the ritual. And that's very helpful for our nervous system. So I would highly recommend that if possible, even in the therapeutic session, that you create some sort of ritual that gets you into that place of openness. Because ketamine allows you to detach from emotions. So you can actually go into them without that emotional charge, right? But then what happens when you're done with it? So that can be leaning into rituals. We all have them. We all use them. We sometimes just are aware of them and what it does to you and what it goes to your environment. You know, in this moment, I'm taking care of fire. And this is very jarring to me in front of all of you. But somehow that fire just grounds you. So I would, I would, that's what I would recommend. I just want to share an experience that I had myself. Um, a couple of years ago, I was invited to have a ceremony in Praga, uh, uh, Pray. Um, my uncle, it's, it's married with a uh, uh, with a wheelchair person, and then uh, they have a baby. So we had the ceremony all night, and like I said. A lot of them were like, what I'm doing here is so hard to see how right? We give them some medicine and they open their hearts. And in the morning, they were singing their songs this, uh, on the uh, Czech, 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 Czech language. In Czech language, they were, they were singing these beautiful songs and I was just amazed. Uh, and I could feel their, their songs. They're, they're, they're singing to the water, they're singing to the flowers. And they're really beautiful, and, and they felt so connected to the land, to their own land. And me too, I was feeling, really, oh my god. I came out, I felt like I was in Oregon or somewhere here, because they just looked the same. And to me, anywhere on this earth, it's the same. We all can connect to those, those elements. The four elements, the flowers, everything. And no matter which English you, you sing to them, it's always going to work. So, for me, it was a really beautiful experience to see that the, they were actually connecting to those, to their own land, to their own flowers, their everything, and their own language. So it was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Koyatu, for for daring to just have me grab you and bring you down here for this. It was kind of a surprise for him. Thank you so much. Can we give him a hand?
and we took the spirit of it away from Bohem, which comes from beautiful flowers, and it's very sacred medicine. And it now causes a lot of harm because of that. And this also happened to tobacco. And we took the spirit out of tobacco and we used tobacco and we commercialized and we put all kinds of crap in it and it causes um, cancer. And cannabis is a very sacred medicine in the South, but it's also, it's also um, not used, but it gets communed with in ceremony. We work with cannabis in ceremony in the South. And, uh, you know, it's a whole industry, even the, the word industry, the cannabis industry. I was in a talk last week where they're talking about the psilocybin industry. And it just curls my skin to think about this beautiful plant spirits being an industry. So, in order for this movement to turn around, like I said at the beginning, we may need to give something up to stand for the protection of the medicine. So my plea to you is, what are we willing to give up so that we can stop this movement from causing harm? What are we willing to give up to have the medicines really truly protected and the sacred ways and the ancestral wisdom be protected? What do we have to give up to not just give a seat to some indigenous people, but to get out of the way and let them the, the movement, what we have to give up. So I will leave you all with that question. I can't say that I have the answers, but I'm sure if we put our hearts together, we can come up with answers together if we're willing to give something up to do the right thing for the medicines and the cultures from where they come that have suffered enough already. And it's time that we turn history around. Thank you. Thank you.